You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. We are here for Monday Night Live. I believe this is number four. I cannot believe I've been this consistent with doing live streams. Live streams are usually not my thing. Um, let's do a quick little recap, uh, before we get our main guests on. This is something people have been asking me to do and I'm not good at it. So I'm going to try to just at the beginning of each show, kind of recap what has been going on in the world of fishing around us. And hopefully as this thing grows, I could do more of it, you know, woods and waters, you have bass blaster, you have all these places that do this thing on a monthly basis. But what's nice is because of how quickly I can get this information out there, I hopefully I can give like weekend scores and updates pretty quick. And so I'm hoping each week it kind of grows out. Uh, some other things like we will not have a live stream next Monday because it is Memorial Day weekend. So I hope everyone kind of had a, will have a great holiday weekend with friends and family, tight lines to all. Uh, so, but I don't want to keep these guys waiting. They're busy men. They're winning checks left and right. So let's get into the first thing. Uh, Northern Virginia Kayak Association, they had a big tournament last weekend or this past weekend on the Shenandoah Upper Potomac or the Rappahannock River. Uh, Jackie George won that thing with 88.25 inches. Um, Chun Ray won with 86.5 for second place. Uh, Mr. Williams, 86. Victor in fourth place had 83.5 inches. And this is purely smallmouth. And so when you're thinking of this and you divide it out between five fish, you're talking 15 plunge, 15 plus inches of smallmouth per fish. That is absolutely insane. And a lot of these guys fish the upper Potomac and the Shenandoah River. And so that really shows you that there are 15 inch smallmouth filling out a full five fish bag on that river. And it's so nice to hear that, that we're getting back to the way things were before that massive fish kill, which is really, really cool. Um, the other thing is Susquehanna Tackle had their first, I believe it's called like the Summer Slam on the upper bay. And they had a really good turnout with that, with um, with with Michael Centaur. He won with 19.57 pounds on the Upper Bay this past weekend, which is really, that's about the, 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 the norm, honestly, for the Upper Bay right now. But the crazy thing is, is the drop-offs. Um, when you get down to like 15th place, it's like 10 pounds. And I've talked about that, I think, on the last live stream where I went down the statistics for all the BFLs. And it's like the Chesapeake almost has this one year class of fish and they're all like completely adults, a lot of five and six pounders, but there you don't have a lot of 12 inches. You don't have a lot of dinks. Whereas like the Potomac is extremely healthy, in my opinion, because you can still catch 12 to 13 pounds, like way down the pay scale. So I think that's just a very interesting look at how the Chesapeake Bay health wise is doing. Um, and then uh, another series that I'm going to follow, I actually reached out to them to get them on the show. Uh, it's called the Ribbon Lips Open Series. They are an electric motor only tournament series. And they were on Beaver Dam uh, down in central Virginia this, this past weekend. I think it was May 20th. 42 boats. Bubba West and Jerry Jenkins won with 20 pounds, 76 ounces out of an electric motor only lake. And that is something I really do want to eventually touch on more so is the fact that Virginia has so many trolling motor only lakes. And if you actually pimped out a John boat, you have access to a lot of cool areas and you can fish tournaments still. So hopefully we'll get that in there. Um, and then guys, if you want, if you're a tournament organization and you want me to kind of give a shout out to you on, on a live stream, just to kind of like recap a tournament trail, I would love to. Um, when the Potomac teams and the Battle of the Borders have their tournaments, I'll just do the same thing. It's super quick, but that way everyone has this for their radio podcast pleasure. Uh, now the next two guys that I have on, uh, one of them doesn't need any introductions because uh, he's my co-host. And we're going to talk about how their season's gone right now with the Shenandoah Valley Bass Association. Uh, you know, I'm just going to bring him in. So first off, we have Jared, man, the myth, and the legend, my co-host, uh, Fishing the DMV. How are you doing tonight, sir? Good. And then we have his partner in crime, I guess the guy that also brings the boat, Brian Brown. Sir, I finally got you on the show. This is awesome. <laughs> So, I mean, just to kind of kick things off, uh, this year you guys are fishing the Shenandoah Valley Association, correct? Yeah, That's correct. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, talk to us about that. This is a series that you guys have all your meetings at Jake's Bait and Tackle. Yeah, and just a little disclaimer too. I mean, we're the we're kind of like that blind squirrel. Um, we, I don't think we don't claim to be great. Um, we'll we'll find a nut every now and again. Um, we've won. We've been top four. 
uh, but we're not consistent. Like we'll go from last to middle. We might win one and then we're back down to the middle or last. And so we're, we're sitting, all over the place. We're all, but we're all over the place. We're not consistent. It is funny. I had somebody comment last week. I, I had um, Matt Mastreichel, SP Fishing, Hunter. He has a great little channel too. And, and Phil's Tackle Club. He makes custom swim baits. I got kind of like, well, why are you having these guys on when they didn't do well? Um, and a quote I had, I bought, I'm dating myself. My, my parents got me for my birthday a VHS tape Outlander. Wow. I know. It was, I was young. VHS. VHS. Yeah, like, young kids are going to have to Google that. Like, VHS, oh my, what the heck is he talking about? You see, I like, that's why I got these guys on tonight because they know what I'm, what I'm talking right. about. And he had that quote up from Sherlock Holmes, which is like, once you eliminate what is false, whatever is left must be true. And right. that, that's freaking Al Linder. And his point is you can learn something in all situations because you got to pull away what's not working. And then whatever's left is what you got to do. And so if you have somebody on that didn't win, that doesn't mean they don't have knowledge. They know what they don't do, what they did learn from them what they did wrong. And it's the same thing with a winner where you can learn what they did correct. And, and so just because you have somebody on guys, just because like they didn't win a hundred thousand dollars, doesn't mean you can't get in their mind about their approach and what they did right and what they did wrong throughout the day. So I just, I just wanted to put that out there for my live streaming audience. Um, and There's then, Brian, to that. That's like, you know, Lake Anna, for example, we, we've had success there in the past, but recently last couple of years, it's been kicking our tail and we've been terrible. We haven't done anything there for, I don't know, six or seven tournaments. But and I like I, our approach and our confidence in that district. And I, I also like how – and, guys, they actually did win a tournament. Don't worry. This is not just them hating themselves for an hour. Um, we're we're going to go through the whole season here. But I did want to give a little bit of love to your organization as well. Uh, how long have you been a part of this club? I think this is year number seven because I bought my boat in 2016, and I think we joined that year. Isn't that right, Jared? Yeah, it sounds about right. And one thing Brian always talked about too, which I think is important, and we went through this too. Like we we jumped in and we had no idea. We fished before, but we're like, man, we don't even know if we're we don't know where we stand. We don't know if we can compete. Like it's kind of, you know, you just don't know. Uh, you're we getting had never a lot of good sticks, and we had never fished before you know, tournaments, and and so we got in not knowing, and and it's just a great group of guys. I mean, it, it's a great club to get in, whether you have experience or not. It's it's just a club that you can get in and, and really learn a lot. I mean, I've learned yeah. a lot. It's taken to us a lot of different waters that I hadn't otherwise fished. And, and so anybody out there is thinking about it, it's a great club to join. Yeah, the camaraderie of this club is 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 definitely one of the um, things that I enjoy the most. It's yeah. it just it's more than just the fishing. It's the, the camaraderie. The guys really make you feel comfortable. There's not a bunch of egos. Um, it's just, it's overall from top to bottom, it's a really good club to, uh, to fish. And the thing for me was it, it allowed me to kind of force me to fish these bodies of water that typically I probably would not, if I left it up to me, I may not have fished some of these bodies of water. Uh, but when they hand you a schedule and then you go mm -hmm. and you fish and it, that's really helped me to, to kind of branch out. How long have you guys been fishing together? Depends how far back you go. Brian and I went to uh, Shepherd together, and I remember going down waiting at the uh, on the Potomac River behind Shepherdstown. Yeah. Some walleye and bass, and and uh, we hunted and fished together. So we're at, we're at Cousins. So we've grown up together. Um, he's done a lot. of. He used to fish uh, shore fish at the beach, too, which I never really got into a whole lot. But so I guess most yeah, of our life. I've done uh, surf fishing a little bit, but uh, I didn't really get into fishing that much until – probably my college years. Um, I didn't hunt at all until my, my roommates in college got me into hunting. And, huh. and then uh, I tell you, it was really when Jake's bait and tackle opened up that I really kind of took it to another level. And uh, cause before that it was just fishing ponds and, and, uh, and then I got a John boat. I had a 15 foot John boat, with a little um, nine horsepower, outboard on the back and i had that for probably eight or nine years and then went from that to the boat that i have now and that's a good point too that like what he just said i think he's got a really nice ranger bass boat and I'm sure he's going to talk to it later but it you know when you look at that he didn't start with that like he just said mm -hmm. guys he literally started off for eight or nine years in, in a john boat that he decked out um with a trolling motor or had a little outboard on the back and trolling motor but it, it you know eight or nine years like that and he saved up his money and you know, so it's he didn't start off with with the boat that he's got now. 
it, how many times, Jared, have we complained when we've done episodes together or I rant about like, why the hell are boats a mortgage payment on a house? Right. It makes no damn sense. And great, they are pretty. They're awesome. I would love one. If you'd like to give me one for free, I will take it. But it should not be a mortgage payment at this point. $100,000 is insane. I mean, it, it really is. So I understand the intrepidation about waiting to get that boat. Mm -hmm. But you got it. And then that was three years ago? Four 2016. years ago? Damn, it's been longer than I thought. Wow. Yeah. I mean, just in a blink of an eye, you know, the warranty's all gone. The five-year warranty on the motor's gone. And it's just like, wow. You know, you, you buy it and you think, oh, I'm going to have this warranty for a while. And, and next thing you know, it's like, you know, it's going on. It'll be this coming October. It'll be seven years since I bought it. And it seems like yesterday when I got it and, um, yeah, it's a lot of money, but the other thing too, is you can't put a price on happiness. You really but, can't. It, it, it's like buying a boat is, will bring you better. I think better memories than anything else that you can do. Um, like even like with the one I have and stuff. And it's like, I, I keep thinking like, well, I could sell and get a house, but it's like, yeah, but then I wouldn't be happy. And it sounds so weird, but it's like, that's my, that's my time. And it's like, you're always going to work. And that was such a thing. Even, even my wife says like, you're, you're always going to end up working. Like, but you've got to find a way to find some happiness. Um, and I kind of like tying that into, you've had that boat seven years. So have you guys been partners then for seven years? Yeah. Yeah. We bought the boat or I bought the boat and then we joined the club that year and we've been fishing it ever since, which is now. Hard. We've been in this club because I remember the first tournament, very first tournament, Jared's just like, well, well where, how do you want to, what's your expectations? And I said, just don't finish last. That's all I cared about was don't get embarrassed and don't finish last. And then it didn't take long to, to realize that, you know, you know, we don't have the experience, but, you know, we, we do know something and, and, um, you know, we can compete on certain days and there's other days that's not doesn't appear that way, but, um, uh, we're going to get to these. We got Brian Henry. My first question is oh. how did y'all do in the Shenandoah Valley catfish association tournament on the Potomac river? We won the catfish tournament. <laughs> we're smoking them. Get the net. Like it's a good one. Hands down, we thought it was a catfish tournament. So we went straight across in the matter woman. And I think what our first four fish we caught were all catfish. And I think all four, we didn't weigh them, but if I had to estimate, I'd say 55 to 60 pounds of what the four fish weighed. Then we finally just said, we got to get the hell away from this area. That's freaking awesome. Dang. Yeah. I mean, at least at least you had something to tug on your line. Um, and then, guys, we're definitely going to get to that Potomac tournament. We're, we're going to keep this kind of – I know some people call me like I'm a little too scatterbrained. I'll keep it a little bit more organized tonight because I there is a, a cool storyline through here about the success you had this year and how it built. And, and part of it was you guys as a team – and you being able to work together and then you also have a boat and you need all that to come together and then you need a place to practice which is lake holiday and that is so interesting because jared you know we talked about this as soon as you guys had the success this year and how much that tied in mm. to possibly how you did and <clears throat> did you immediately start fishing lake holiday when you got the boat or they're talking to me either one yeah yeah matter of fact um the funny story is I, I bought the boat and I ended up moving my uh, living room wall two foot into the house in order to get my boat to fit. That is so when I bought there. the boat, I brought it home. I cut an eight foot hole through the wall, back the boat in, and right where the once the garage door shut, I marked right where the prop was in the living room, marked it, and built a wall. Jared told me just don't worry about a wall, put curtains on both sides. But I told him put some lights crap. up, like accent lights. <laughs> so yeah, so and ever since then, having the boat up there and only being two minutes from the boat ramp, it it's it's been. Um, I think when you have a body of water that you have to drive a half hour, forty five minutes to get to, sometimes that mm -hmm. will talk you out of going. Versus knowing you could be on the lake and loaded up and on the lake within 20 minutes fishing that def definitely takes a um um uh, is a big deal as far as getting on the water um and for us it's a deep clear lake so that's helped us at lake ann it's helped us at all they hadn't helped us with tidal water 
I mean, that's for damn sure. Um, but being able to get on the lake and, you know, pitching docks and that type of thing, I think has really helped both of us. Is there a story here? <laughs> Brian, you are savage tonight in the comment section. I might have to give you a prize for this. Uh, Is so there anyone who can block him? <laughs> Uh, possibly, depending on how this night goes. Um, and so for our podcast listeners, Brian says, is that how the bat got into the house? Well, three oh. weeks after moving in, I, I, uh, one 30 in the morning, I had a bat fly into my bedroom and, um, it was, it was chaos for about an hour and a half. <laughs> and I didn't even have much, of a, I didn't have a ranger. I had a John boat at that point. I went. Hmm. Building the suspense up. Throws up. I think he did. Story as the story goes, too. He used a, a paddle or an oar to uh, get rid of the bat. <clears throat> so how long? Like so, then was that your first time really doing some tournament fishing? Then when he got the boat, or were you a co angler before then? Yeah, no, that's that's really when we started. We joined, and uh, you know, once he got the boat, you know, we we felt like we could. Uh, you know, jump, jump into these tournaments. Uh, before that, you know, we never really had fished competitively uh, before, before that time. That's so, that's so crazy. And you guys generally feed off each other so well, because there are so many tournament partners that just fight like tooth and nail and do not jive well together. And it almost sometimes in some of these like tournament organizations, the, the, just go to like Lake Anna or the Potomac River or Smith Mountain Lake or whatever. It's like teen high school drama with, with co-anglers and stuff. Y'all have gelled well for a long time. Is that just, is that because you're related or just because, yeah, you guys just vibe really well? I think it has a lot to do with it. Yeah, we are cousins, but we're also, um, you know, we'll kick around ideas and then we may not react to that idea. We'll kind of let it sit there and simmer. Like we joke around because a lot of times we're like, you ready to go to another spot? And then it seems like every time we say it, we catch a fish and next thing you know, we're there an hour later. We hadn't moved yet. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll kick back and forth. There's been several times down at the chick that Jared, you know, things are slow and Jared be just like, you want to head to the docks and be just like, I don't have a real reason why we shouldn't go to the docks and, and we go. So yeah, we do bounce stuff back and forth and listen to each other, which I think is a huge, um, mm -hmm. a huge benefit. And I also, I'm usually on the trolling motor. We, I don't know. What are we? 60, 40. Jared, All right. Yeah. Um, I also try to keep in mind that if we're fishing docks, you know, yeah, I could have a better position if I have the dock to myself, but if I cut him out on the back of the boat, that doesn't help because mm -hmm. you still need, you know, there's two lines in the water at, at that time. And if I'm blocking him off, so I kind of keep that in mind too, because I do hear, you know, times, you know, people, you know, I got back boated or whatever. And so I think you need to be uh, open to remember who's on the back of the boat and also listen to it, communicate back and forth. So I think that is a, a big thing. It is tough too. like, you're like, you know, we go back and forth. The hot hand is always, it could be him. It could be me. And I went, I went through a long drought there and I tell you, it really, it works on your mind when, when you're not catching fish. And, and you want to contribute and, you know, he's catching fish and I'm not. And it just really starts working on you and you just have to continue to work through that. And then it might be two or three tournaments later, you know, then, then, you know, you turn the corner and then you start having success. And it's, you know, when you can both put it together, obviously you're going to be dynamite, uh, but it's just kind of feeding on each other too. And, and knowing it's kind of like a three, three point shooter. You know, if you got the hot hand, you know, you're going to go with that. And, and we've, I think we both have, you know, a little bit different styles too. And that's one thing I think we also do well. Like we're not trying, like, even if he's catching, like I've tried, like whether it be a shaky hit or whatever, it's not, I'm not always going to have success with what he's using. So I just stick with, you know, maybe what I'm doing or vice versa. And and sometimes it works. We're just, I think we're very open-minded and flexible when we fish and, mm -hmm. um, and don't take it too serious. I've always heard said too, like if you take it competitive fishing, competitive, anything can, can take the fun out of it. And if you take it too serious, uh, and don't get me wrong. I mean, we get sideways sometimes, but uh, but you got to remember it's fishing, and uh, <laughs> you can't you can't take it too serious. Yeah, that is true. I mean, yeah. you're out there. Anybody who's a competitor who who's played, and you know, I played college baseball. Jared played college baseball, and so there's that competitive nature. So you're out there, and you got eight hours to get five fish in the boat. When things aren't going well, you know, it's it's not just oh well, I'm 
out here having fun, you know, and I do take it seriously. And, um, but yeah, there are days out there where, uh, I remember two different days down the chick where I had just a phenomenal day with the chatterbait and Jared's on the back of the boat. He ties the same thing on and he says, I am trying to mimic everything you're doing and could not get bit. And then there was another day where he was tearing it up on a spinner bait and I'm on the front of the boat trying to do the same thing. And, and, uh, so it's, it's funny when Jared and I, whoever's got the hot hand on Saturday, usually the other guys have had a hot hand the very next day. Mm -hmm. usually, we never get it together. where We both have the hot hand the same day. It seems like. Or when you do, it's when you guys cash checks. <laughs> well, except for that first tournament down there at Smith mountain, that was a hundred percent all Jared. All five oh, all we're going to get there. We are going to get people. there. Yeah, I was just a net man. I mean, I would say I drove the boat, but we didn't really go that far. So I can't even say I drove the boat. So I was just a net man that day. I mean, that was a phenomenal day. You guys bring up something, and I, I do love like where we can go on these tangents. You guys have both played sports. I, I played baseball in college. And so you probably will get this better than a lot of people about yips. You get that weird block. It's whether it's a pitcher or or whatever. The Chesapeake Bay it has my number to the point of, and I brought this up where halfway through the day, I stopped fishing intelligently and I started thinking like, I am going to blank. It's tidal water. When I fished a tournament out of Pohick and I stayed in Pohick, I didn't have a fish right away, but I knew it's like, listen, the tide's going to get right. I'm going to catch him. And I did very well. Same scenario on Chesapeake. And my mind is like, oh, I'm going to suck again. And it was in my head. When you guys are fishing now, do you believe in the yips and, and, how do you kind of work through that? Well, I, there for me there for a while, like I had a lot of success on the Ned rig. Like I just felt like I didn't care where it went. I could pick it up and, and I could fish slow and I could catch fish and quality fish. And it, it's funny how things go in and out because the Ned rig for me, it's just, it's just like disappeared for me. And, mm -hmm. and I don't know if, that's me or if that's just fishing in general or what, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, you definitely have certain things that when you look at a rod on the deck and you're just like, I have no confidence in that. I'm not going to pick it up. And, and you just have to keep going at it. until you find something that you do have confidence in. I think the other thing for us too, since we are so busy, we don't, we don't get a chance to pre-fish hardly at all. And we don't like, it's kind of like we show up and we've, we've had that seven year experience of going to these lakes, but, but that changes too. And so I've heard, you know, talk about not fishing history. Well, we're all guilty of that. So I think the other thing that we're, that I like that we do, and this, we don't know, it doesn't always work, but I appreciate the fact that, you know, like you're saying, you're blank and we, we stay on it, but at the same time, we're also not afraid to say, you know what, let's go find some new water. And I can't tell you how many times, like, and it doesn't always work, but we'll find something new that will pay off later. And again, we may not cash a check, but we have found a new new body of water, you know, or learn to fish maybe offshore. Start like right now, we're starting to pay attention more to contour lines and just kind of go off the grid a little bit and just, you know, try to explore. And, and that's tournament time is not the best time to do that, obviously. But we look at it as, you know what, we have nothing to lose. And it's not like we've got 20 pounds in the box right now. So let's just go. Let's go find something new. So let's go find some different water. And, and sometimes, like I say, that pays off. Yeah, and we have stumbled on some spots that we still fish to this day because we did do that in the past. Um, and that was on tournament time. So, um, yeah, I agree with everything he's saying. I mean, that that's that's so interesting because you, you're, you're attacking it as a group. And I think that's so important, the difference when you are – fishing as a turn fishing a tournament by yourself and fishing it with a partner and 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 that is there's the banana in the boat brian yeah but i think this kind of ties in with what you're saying matt york matt are you related to one of my students because i feel like i know a bunch of yorks but anyway how do you get ready for a tournament if you cannot practice good question there and i think this is something that you need to kind of get del delve into if you're going to lake muma okay whatever that's on the damn schedule you guys can't practice, right? So how how would you guys get ready for a tournament like that? Like I'm gonna look at not Navionics first, and just like I know, like Navionics, and again, like big on contour lines, deep drops next to shallow water. If you can find, um, if you can find current, a creek, a river, whatever that's hitting an outside bank or a point, 
you know, just really doing your homework on that. And then Brian does a good job of electronics. And then if you do get a, like on a safe practice day, if we got a two day and we get down there, even if we get on the water for a couple hours, kind of check those spots out and just see if there are fish on it. Uh, but Brian does a good, does the same thing. We're constantly looking at maps and uh, you want, you can talk to that too, Brian. Yeah. It's, I, I just downloaded the, uh, the new version of the Navionics. I've got it on my phone. I've got it on my iPad. So there's an icing I'm laying in bed and I've got the iPad and, you know, if I'm not spending money on tackle, I'm on, you know, Navionics and you're looking at where the contour lines are and the new Navionics has got the topo map with the, with the contour lines and everything else. And so you can get really familiar with, with, mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if somebody says you should fish docks that are close to deep water, you can find all that on avionics so it helps you get familiarized but nothing like the old saying goes nothing uh replaces actual time on the water so it's just it's the next best thing that you can do but it still does not replace time on the water and i think it's also it matt if i if i could add to the question some or add to the the comment it is hard to fish offshore without practice. When my brother and I did fish a lot of tournaments or I had the flexibility in my schedule, you listen to music or a podcast and you sit there and you just graph. You just graph indefinitely because you have all that information. So if you know that, hey, this is the cove I'm going to fish, you graph the whole, the whole cove so you know where every stump is. So when the tournament happens, everything's already pre-ready. And so you're like, okay, well, they were on this dock. They probably slid out to the stump I found. And you have that done. You can't fish that way without practice. And so you need to be good at fishing the bank, fishing stuff you can see. Because again, like you just you you would just be wasting so much time out there in the ether that is offshore. And like you said, that's where Navionics and Google Maps, Google yeah. Maps and Google Earth Pro. Um, Google Earth Pro, uh, comment guys, chat, help me out. I believe it's still free. You can go back two or three years with that. So uh, Kerr has a pull down. You can go back on Google Earth and know what the water's like 15 feet down and then go waypoint every stump. So there are different things that you can do to help you out for the bank fishing opportunities. So just, just to add a little bit to that. Yeah. What was your first tournament this year? Lake Anna. Talk to me about that. Hmm. Um, <laughs> I did have a chance. I, I did have a chance to go down um, one day during the week. I think it was a Thursday before and uh, did a little pre-fishing, went with a, an old timer, uh, Marine vet. And, you know, I and we did, we found a new spot uh, up late that, you know, end up, you know, producing for us. I think it's one of those spots that we could go back to. I think we finished, I think it was like 13th out of, I don't know, 23 or something. Wasn't great. Uh, I think we only managed four pounds, but um, we ran some of our first, you know, some of the stuff that we knew first and, um, just didn't pan out for us early. Yeah. Lake Anna is, is the past, I don't know, five, six, seven tournaments where we've had success before just doesn't seem like it's producing. And if it does produce, it's, it's not producing the size that it used to produce. And, and again, it's hard for us to kind of kind of forget history and go try something new because you're always thinking about that man that day i had here in this cove and you always think well i can redo that again and then three tournaments you're like that damn thing hasn't produced at all mm -hmm. so i mean it, it's hard to turn your back on history but and i will tell you too something i did learn that was fascinating to me that uh experience in practice i, I caught one on a chatterbait we rolled up to the same cove it's a mouth of a, a small cove a small cut and we approached it outside in basically through a lot of different things, you know, that we're staying back, throwing into the mouth of the cove, nothing, nothing, nothing. We went kind of right to left around the cove and the craziest thing, and I, I never would have thought about this before, but it wasn't until I got back and through the, the, I mean, it was the identical angle, identical angle with that chatterbait, let it sink, you know, three or four feet and then start it back. I, I caught the fish. And it was it was just wild because I'd already casted, you know, eight or 10, 10, 12, 15 cast from a different angle into the same spot in the same area. It, it that angle, for whatever reason, that day seemed to matter. And, and I, I'm sure that happens more times than not. Uh, but it mimicked the practice day catch um, and the fish were there. I mean, I think we had I don't know if we had two out of that 
hole or not. But and like Brian said, we gosh, we 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 don't second guess that. We knew we were on fish. It just we couldn't get the other ones to eat. Uh, yeah, and I have I have all the data up here too. And then we got oh my god, the amount of chats. You guys are rock stars. Um, Chris Sherwood, uh, Lake Anna has my number two. Lake Lake Anna can be an absolute tough place. He also said, just noticed the BTL St. Jude's T-shirt. Very cool, Brian. Awesome stuff. Uh, Greg C, reach out to me. What do you mean by ban kayaks? I need more context than that. That is so random. I need more context, please. Um, it took sixteen point seven. Wait, yeah, sixteen point seventeen pounds by Blake and uh, Sheer. Sure. Sheer. Sure, Thank yeah. you. Thank you to win that thing. 15 and second, 15 and third. And then it kind of plummets down. But the fact is you guys, even though it was 4.6 pounds, 13th place, and then it goes all the way down to basically a ton of zeros. You survived. Right. You know what I mean? Like you survived. Mm -hmm. I, I fished the, um, the Antietam Bassmaster's trail this year because it's literally the only one that didn't have any interference in the schedule. We went to Raystown and it was snowing. It was during that weird like El Nino thing. And I guts and nuts it together with a blade bait to have enough to, to finish well. Was it a great event? No, but you survived and you mm -hmm. got to the next one. Right. I think that's what's important. You guys made the decisions because you could have blanked and where would you be in the points? You right. know what I mean? That's a good point. And Jared, I like what you said about like the angle. A lot of people wouldn't think that mm -hmm. about how the angle is important. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one other thing about Lake Anna too is when we first started this club, I think we – one year, I think we fished it. It was on the schedule five times. Mm, good point. And so we were fishing it anywhere from three to five times a year. And the past couple of years, I think it might have only been maybe one or maybe two two times a year, spring and the fall, or just once a year. It's kind of one and done. So I think we did well early on because, you know, we were going down there so often and you could pick up what you learned from one day right into the next and and uh, so i think that alone i think has affected you know us not being able to fish it well mm. and lake anna's like the numbers on a lot of these weekend tournaments down here the weekend series i mean the, the bags down there are just you know 25 to 30 pound bags i'm gonna google something real quick because i like how big is lake and because like this is yeah so and yeah here's the thing so it says lake lake anna is thirteen thousand acres when you bring it up that's not true so i think this is really important for people that kind of visit or have asked me about places like this lake anna says it's thirteen thousand acres that does not include private and public side lake anna is small as hell when you talk about the side that these people are doing i will figure out in another episode like how big it is but i think it's like six thousand nine thousand acres is what you guys can fish put a hundred boats on that that thing gets crowded really quick when you yeah. put everything else in there it's a very small lake mm -hmm. that is true and that I, happens too like you know and everybody says it and that, i mean again i don't look at this as a bad thing like some of the, the locations or spots you think about fishing you roll up and you know somebody's already sitting on the 28 bridge somebody's sitting in this hole on this point you know and you just got to keep moving and and find something something else but to your point thomas you're right it can get it can get busy yeah, and then actually, I just found it right here. Let me click on right there. I'm doing it. So, if you look at this here, the public side is roughly nine thousand acres, while the private side is roughly four thousand. Wow! That that can, now now I, I guess the other question that we had there was now add in every kayak, every person going out there to fish with their kid, and then every tournament out there. Nine thousand acres, dude. That's every dock has a boat on it, basically, right. depending on the time of year. Yeah, that's and, insane. And this the way this winter was this past year they have a winter series down there and it's every you know they got the sunday morning series and and so it's being fished pretty much year round and then uh steve uh mcgraw yeah so 9600 we're off by 600 acres absolutely sir so the point is it's super small for some of these tournaments now honestly if you could just nuke a couple of those canals and make this thing open up i think it would fish way different i don't know why i that would be a good episode, actually, is to get somebody on who actually built the dam to actually why they made a private versus because there's nuclear power plants on different lakes and they don't make a private public side. So that'd be interesting why they did that there. Uh, sorry, side tangent. Um, but you survived Lake Anna. And that's my point is it's a super pressured, super <clears throat> tight place to have a big boat tournament with an engine. Mm -hmm. What's the next event? 
uh, I believe Chick Hominy, right? Two day Chick. Because uh, your schedule was stacked with like you guys were traveling all yeah. up and down for yeah, we had two months weeks. or two travel overnights <laughs> in, in one month. It was Smith Mountain Lake and then the Chick. Oh, okay. That all right. right. Good point. So it was Lake Anna, then Smith? Then a two day at Smith. Okay. And then two day at the Chick. Got here we go. So we're going to set this thing up. So they had a two day at Smith. They have had good success on Smith before. Last year, uh, and I apologize, I did not write this down in my notes. So if you guys could tell me, um, how did you guys do last year at Smith? I think it was a third and a fourth, I think. Yeah. Yeah, third Which, and fourth. Really solid for a lake that is basically on the moon compared to where we all live it's mm -hmm. way the hell out there and yet you guys dominate and that was really the first time i'd fished it really i didn't know that yeah i did yeah, I that period and that right we went down there for the break-in period on my boat in october right and yeah most of the water we had fished been down by the dam and this this one uh, i think what oak grove and uh you know we we went down just we didn't go far there either and spent Honestly, we spent the better part of two days in, in one cove and just kept recycling. And, you know, I know Ray and Randy, they had a five pounder out of this cove and there's a lot of boats in and out of it, but we just kind of stayed in it and, uh, you know, had some good success. There's a shoal, you know, point, but we just kind of recycled that water for two days and made some different runs, different places. But most of the fish, you know, came out of that cove. But you said recycle. Mm -hmm. That's a very key thing. Yeah, we had it talked meant. about leaving, but we figured, you know, don't leave fish to go find fish. And so, and they were quality fish too. I mean, they were quality tournament mm -hmm. fish. So uh, the fish we were catching didn't give us a reason. I mean, we had 22,000 acres worth of water and we literally were in a cove that was walking distance from where we launched. And we never left it for two days because there was no reason to leave it. But you had to have that conversation. And was that like basically you guys were fighting each other in the front of the boat? Like, how did that conversation go down of like, should we leave or not? Well, when you don't have much other, other we don't have, we didn't have a lot of points, same thing. So it's like, <laughs> and I think, you know, I remember too catching, uh, I think it was about a four pounder on a whopper plopper on a shoal. And what was crazy about that one too is it had a jointed uh, top water bait that had one hook here and one hook down its side. And it's still eating that plopper, you know. So again, I, you know, I, I think, I always I think about pressure and different things and like, you know, but, you know, those fish are that thing still had treble hooks in its mouth and it's still eating, you know, big old plopper. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, and I think we had enough success. You know, we had passed by a dock, you know, throw in, we throw two or three baits in, but it would be it'd be coming back through the second time, you know, it would hit a top water, you know, trying different things. But, you know, fishing that same water now, whether or not the fish was there and didn't eat the first time or it moved out from under the dock and was up feeding along the bank. I don't know, but um, it went to show that, you know, you can just kind of stay in an area and, and keep catching fish. Yeah, I think that's the hardest thing I've realized, too, in my evolution as an angler is, like, you can sit in an area. I sat in Pohick and caught, like, 30 fish. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, high school, college, I would have never done that. I would have been burning 200 gallons of petrol. Right. And it's so interesting when you realize, like, there's a lot of fish in these areas, like a mm -hmm. lot. And we just think, like, once we hit a dock, clearly, like, this dock will never have a fish in it again. But the idea of, like, no, there's something about this cove. There's something about this area. And you just got to milk it. And, and that is hard, I think, for young anglers to grasp sometimes. Well, and every time we thought about leaving – one of us would catch a fish and we were like, all right, that kept us there for another 45 minutes. And then we thought about leaving again and then we'd catch another one. And, and so that's usually how it happens. We'll say, yeah, let's go ahead and leave, but then we'll cast another five minutes before we actually leave. And then usually we end up catching one that keeps you there for a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, it was a good cove and, and it, 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 it produced last year. It didn't produce this year. But it gets into this year. And then before, to kind of get caught up on some of these things, Steve McGraw, again, the private side is a cooling pond for the nuclear power plant. Um, Steve, please message me. I'd like to get you on the show. Um, I don't think that's all the, all the reasons, because if you look at the property values also, the property values are like almost double on the private side. So I think there's also another incentive there to keep it private, quote unquote. Um, let's see. Scott Klein. What's up, guys? What's up, Scotty? Too, bud. Um, let's see. 
Oh, here we go. Here's a good question. Can you join as a co-angler or do you need to know an angler? And I'm assuming it's to join the Shenandoah Valley Bass Association. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, and I don't know if it's too late now, but if um, you always come to those meetings because there's there's boaters that are looking for co-anglers. So you don't have to have a boat. Um, it's nice to know somebody if you if you can come with them. But if not, if you come to the meeting uh, or just let us know uh, that you're interested and there is some single guys out there, anglers. Sometimes they like fishing by themselves, but uh, it doesn't hurt to ask and to answer your question. Yes, you can by all means join and then kind of serve as a substitute also until you find that you know person that you want to partner up with. Perfect. I think we're all caught up. Did you change? And we'll save those questions for later. You get to this year. What has changed in your approach? You know you're going to go to Smith for two days. You had success in the past. Is your thought process we're just going to go to where we made cash last year and just live or die? Well, we had a practice day. We got down late, but we got on the water probably, what, Brian, 3 o'clock or something on Friday. Yeah, it was the weekend that they were calling for like 65-mile-hour winds, and which it, that did happen, but it was um, – actually, that was a tournament day, right? Yeah, that, that was tournament day. It and rained on us in practice. With by the time that happened, but uh, the day before, uh, it was just dreary, really raining, and um, we went out. And uh, what we fish, two hours. Yeah, a couple hours. But like you said earlier, Thomas, what was cool about that is you know it's kind of like we we didn't find them shallow. Now guys caught them shallow. So again, just mm -hmm. understand. There's I'm learning too when you talk to guys. There's more than one way to catch a fish, and it's not to say that one way only catches fish, but we what we found out what wasn't working for us day one. And I was hearing a lot of you know doc talk from guys, and you're talking fishing six, seven, eight hours in practice, one fish, maybe three over two days. You know, it's kind of like, and in my mind, I, I was kind of equated that to, and we did the same thing and didn't catch in practice. So it's kind of like, well this is not working. So maybe we have to try something that, and, and chances are, I would say eight out of 10 people are going to pound the banks, you know, and so let's, let's try something different in my mind. I was thinking that let's try something different than, that nobody else is doing. Maybe. You so launched basically going into the next day. We had zero game plan. <laughs> it, so basically was, going in, we didn't know what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to go to the cove that we had success in and just see what would happen. Now this year we were what? three weeks earlier. Mm -hmm. So the water temp was, there was some question Big. whether it was spawn, post-spawn. Um, mm -hmm. And so we were, I think the water was warmer last year when we were there, if my memory serves mm -hmm. me correctly. But And I'll say too, <laughs> and going into this tournament, like Brian was saying, it was, it was calling for 30 to 40 mile an hour consistent winds with 60 mile an hour gusts. And it was so bad, and I think there was two or three boats that didn't even come to the ramp. And I like the way they did it, though. They said, basically, we're going to show up and make a decision that morning. They even talked about taking a boat out to the main and just kind of seeing the conditions, keeping an eye on the weather. And, and it was weird. It was a weird morning because, like, half of us thought there's no way we're fishing today. The re And everybody's also saying, look, we drove four hours. Even if they bang the tournament, uh, which, I mean, which you can't fault it with with those conditions mm. uh we're still going to go fish because we'll stay tucked in a cove we'll stay off the main you know we're not going to go down there and just you know sit around so we're gonna we're gonna put the boats on the water and fish anyway and and so there was a lot of mixed feelings going into that day whether you either gonna even gonna fish um mentally and uh but we end up getting on the water and it, it's a go and and we they decide we're gonna we're gonna fish we're gonna get this thing started um so so you blast off then? Well, so that's what's, one. well, so they Sir. blasted and like it was weird. I was putting, we buttoned up, pulled the trolling motor up. They're they're announcing numbers, we're blasting off. And as I was putting my jacket on and zipping it up, and just before I sat down, I looked over Brian's shoulder, and there's a point, uh, and I saw some top water action. I saw you know what looked appeared to be a bass hit the top, and and I kind of looked at Brian, and we do this a lot, where. Like, we'll just drop the trolling motor. Like, you know, we don't go very far. We'll just drop the trolling motor and start fishing. And I kind of look at it as, and unless you have a spot that you know is really going to produce, making that long run is great. I'm not going to knock it. But at the mm -hmm. same time, we I kind of look at it as, 
that's a time that you could be fishing, you know. And if you always hear about guys saying, I caught them in the first half an hour, 45 minutes, you got that bite window, you know, so let's let's not miss that. So I said, hey, let's drop the trolling motor. And he said, okay. We came unzipped, dropped the trolling motor, went over to that point. Was yeah, and I was actually messing with the electronics. I wasn't even ready to blast off at that point. And then I saw it too, and he was just like, let's hit that. I want to go over and throw top water before we head out. And I was like, all right. And then what, your first fish was, I think, maybe two pounds. Yeah, and it was the, only about 14 inches. The fish was 6'2", 6'20", or 6'23", I think. And then his third fish was five-something. Well, well, well let, let's slow down a little bit here. So a point is is vague to a lot of people. Were you fishing up in the pea gravel, like right on the bank? Were you off of it? Like, like what, what do you mean by like, oh, there's a point here? So it's a secondary point too. It's not out on the main. It's back in the cove. And, um, you know, and, and what you what you find too is, and as we've learned this up Lake Holiday, you learn, I mean, most guys that fish know that that point is going to go way out into the water. Mm. Uh, but depth of it too, the first one probably came in 20, probably 20 foot of water. And then the second one, the, the, the big girl came in probably, it was 35 plus up to 50, 40 to 50 foot of water. Now, obviously she wasn't on the bottom. She was suspended. And what's weird too, you talk about a game plan, like we didn't have that game plan going in. We had success. And then we started looking and seeing why we had success and come to find out we were, as I was saying earlier, the main Creek channel comes down and hits that point and it's well off the bank. And so you've got a Creek channel, you got a lot of, a lot of debris and stuff down in that Creek channel. You got a lot of bait ball action going on. So it wasn't, you know, pea gravel. It was, it was well off the point. And basically these fish were just kind of suspended out in a Creek channel. Uh, eating bait fish. Interesting. Interesting. Cause like how much of this, your mindset with this had to do with Lake holiday? A lot. I think, and I, I think, you know, and I can talk to that just briefly. Um, I, I struggle. I think most people struggle with that suspended bass. You know, you think 50 foot of water, how do you fish 50 foot of water? It's, it's near impossible, but you know, there's spy baits, there's different things, underspin, Brian likes to underspin. You know, I had learned up at Lake Holiday, the Mega Bass uh, Okashir, I think it's called. You know, it's it's just a small little prop um, head, basically. And I put the uh, Mega Bass uh, Haze Dong, the three inch, uh, right Hold here. On. I'll get you widescreen. Hold on, let's go widescreen. There you go. Perfect. So this little haze dong on the back of it, on the back of this thing right here. How heavy? Uh, this, I think, is only a 16th. They have two sizes. I do like the lighter size. But this thing right here, I mean, there's no magic to it. I mean, it's it's as simple as it comes. Uh, but this thing, as it falls down through the water column, you can see right there the tail action. And this little prop spinner on the front, it is just doing its thing. And I literally... I mean, Brian was like, what are you doing? I said, nothing. I throw it out. Uh, it was eight pound test, little six, six combo spinning rod. And as that thing just falls through the water column and what would happen, I would throw it out and I would just give a little bit of line and I just, I would hold the rod down by my side and, and give it about a 30 second count. And so what I've learned happens is this thing actually crosses their face on the fall. It crosses their face, whatever depth they're suspended at. They usually eat it. And then when I do bring it back up, I start to jig it up. I feel it's heavy. They've eaten it. I just, you know, set the hook. And that first, that six pounder, I mean, I thought it was a catfish. It was, it was, I mean, I got a lighter action rod, but it, it stayed deep, stayed down. I told Brian, I was like, it's a catfish. He said three and times it's a catfish. Three times. I'm like, this is a catfish. There's no, no oh, chance it's a bass. It, it when it would get close, it would dig under. What's that? I said it didn't want to come up. It stayed down. No. I started questioning it, and then I caught a glimpse of it, and I said, "No, nope, that's not. That's not a catfish." He you said, not "Ass," and that's when you know you stop breathing, and <laughs> and uh, but it's it's nothing magic to it. It's just, and it's I don't know. It's just one of those do nothing baits that you know I've had. We've had, and to answer your question, yes, Lake Holiday, I've had success on it at Lake Holiday. I've learned how to fish it, you know, for deeper fish, suspended fish, and it, it just so happened to work that day. See, and I've I've fished Lake Frederick. In Lake Holiday, those two lakes primarily, and the the there's not much shallow water. It's it drops off quick. So if you want to be successful there, you have to learn to fish deep water. And I think that's what's 
helped us is that we're not afraid to be in 35 foot of water and and fish that kind of depth where some guys are like it's got to be shallow they can't you know it's kind of it's kind of like a a mental block that you can't fish you know deep water so um, but we can do both i prefer deep water i prefer offshore but i'll fish you know shallow as well too this is another good point do you guys have forward facing sonar or live scope yeah. you did all this without that technology mm-hmm and I think it's funny because like people are like, well, you can't do it. And it's like, it's nice to have, but it doesn't mean you need it or you can't fish the style. I got to figure out what I have now before I could take that jump. <laughs> so I've got, I've got the HDS three. I've got the down imaging, the side imaging. Um, and, and what we found where he was catching his fish was off that uh, offshore point that was down 35 feet. There was also standing timber there. And I could clearly see that on the graph. So that's why we just kind of hung right around where that standing timber was. And, and, and for you guys, I, I got, I finally found it on his Facebook. Uh, let me get this up here. Uh, I think it's this slouch. My God, that's a watermelon. Uh, six pounds, right? Oh, yeah. 620. What was the net job on that thing? Like, was there a lot of cussing and praying? I pretty much hold my breath until it gets in the boat. Uh, yeah, the cussing came a little later. Yeah, That's we'll tell you the cussing does come later. <laughs> Brian's the net man. I I, I struggle. I just uh, I couldn't without four fish center. The fact is that you're off a of point. You see him suspended, and you drop. That is such a very specific technique to be able to do that and have success with it. And that you had the confidence to eat that out there and do that is impressive because that is a slaunch of a Well, fish. and you look at that bait he just showed you, and that little thing caught in two casts caught 11 pounds. You know, really? Fish after that was five, five something. Probably not 10 five. minutes later. Yeah. Yeah. It eats again. And I think, and I was telling Brian too, and it is true. I've had them choke it, but they usually, when they eat that thing too, it's always right here. I mean, it catches them right there in the top of that mouth, that yeah. lip. And every one of them sound hook set. Yep. And it doesn't take much. And then the other thing too was like, you can slow roll it, but once it went down to the steepest point and I, and I start bringing it up, like take up my slack, I bring it up. I just yo-yo it. I mean, there's, it's not, there's not a right or wrong way to fish it, but, I'm letting it get that drop down and then, then bringing it up and then just kind of yo-yoing it back to the boat as it comes. And so, you know, again, you could slow roll it, but it, I think for me, when I think about suspended bass, are they at 12 foot, 15, 20? And I think by letting it cro- again, cross their face, whether it be up or down, you know, and you'll feel it, you'll feel it get heavy. And you know, it's, it's on usually it's not much of a hook set. I think I got, and I got guys also, I think this other fish, let me get that up here, here, do, do, do. So these are both, so that's your six and your five right there? Correct. Yeah. Was this in the same area too then? It, when you meant back-to-back cash, you meant like basically like right in the same yeah, area. Yeah, same area, probably within, I think maybe five or 10 minutes of each other. Yeah. Fished, um, I don't know, it's probably what, a 75 yard stretch. Yeah. There where we were seeing the timber. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was all offshore. It was nowhere near. A dock nowhere near the bank. Mm, dude, that's freaking awesome. Whoop, I messed up there clicking too much. All right, we then here. we go over. I mean, the f- Larry, Larry H7, whatever, 237. What is yo yo? I guess what he means, what what does yo yo mean? So basically, like, if I guess, I guess if you're going to work an old school yo yo, it's just up and down. So, you know, it's just letting it free fall down. And then instead of bringing a straight retrieve back, as it comes down, as you bring it up, just kind of lift your rod up so that it's going to give a, an action where it's going up and then drops down, up mm. and then drops down. And then you, and you can do that as short or as long as you want, you know, back to the boat. Um, it's, it's just an up and down, you know, technique. Are you engaging the reel? Are you casting out, locking the spool, and then just holding the line and letting it pendulate? I would, no, I would let it, I would throw it out, make a long cast, Sometimes I even just give a little bit of line, but then I would kind of just hold the rod down by my side. So the whole time, it's it's just a ba- think of it as a free fall. Just let that thing free fall down through the water column, um, and you're just going to cover water, like I say, from where your cast is back. Uh, try to think of it again, covering a 12 to 20 foot, maybe not quite 20. It's not going to be 20 as you get closer back to the boat, but you know, 12 to 15 foot depth as you're working it back. 
Wow. Guys, we have 20, 30 people watching right now. Please like and share uh, this stream right now. You're getting absolute juice from two legends in the local industry right here. Um, keep it going. So we go up to the next. Uh, we go right around. Like, we kind of do get close to the bank. We're still on the bank. And Brian's throwing an underspin, which he has tremendous success on the underspin. I've seen him up here on Lake Holiday just wear him out. And tell him about that one, Brian. Yeah, I had a, uh, it's a cool baits underspin with that four inch Kitek on there. And uh, this one actually was up close to the bank. And this one was a small mouth and he hit it like a freight train. And of course, this is right after, this was after your first two, right? Yep. We, so had, we had three fish three. alive at the point. And so I get it all the way to the boat. The drag is just, just squealing and Jared grabs the net and it may As before he comes back, That's intense. he's, I mean, he's got it coming. I've got the net. I'm actually down on my knees. I've got the net alongside the boat already down in the water. And anybody knows smallmouth. Uh, and this thing, it, it's three pounds. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It's a four pound smallmouth because we catch a three pounder the next day. And he asked me, he was like, what do you think? You know, mine? I said, oh, I know for a fact it was a four pounder. There's no doubt in my mind. It was, it was a pound heavier or more than, than that one. So. He gets I think in. More up about that. I think he was probably more pissed versus being excited about the six pounder because it's hours later and he's just like, "Man, I'm sorry." I don't know how many times he said, "I'm sorry." So, so then we're going back in and we had 17 pounds and he's just like, "Man, I'm sorry." And I'm like, "What? I think we're going to do pretty good." And he's just like, "That fish would have put us over 20 pounds." And it, I was hoping it didn't cost us, but to, to finish the story, the, the net, the fish comes in. He, it's coming in hard towards the boat. I lift the net up. I lift the net up. I swear to goodness, the fish is in the net coming towards the boat. And all in one motion, it, it turns around 180. And its belly, is as I'm trying to lift it up, the belly is belly walking on top of the water. It gets outside the net before I can get it out of the water and comes unbuttoned. I mean, mm, it is. Dude. Oh, actually, I still had him on until he got about, I don't know, 10 feet away from the net. And then when he changed direction, Lure went flying, and I was just like, oh, my gosh. I was sick. I, and he said, he was like, that fish was on crack. I mean, it, it everything was. happened so quick. And if you know smallmouth, that's how they are anyway. And so, I mean, I'm beating myself up because I'm like, way to go, net man. You got one job, get that in the <laughs> boat. And, and it's just like, but, I mean, it wasn't like I knocked it off or anything. I didn't hit his line. It's just a matter of it It wasn't coming in the boat. That, that's just fishing, though. I mean, that yeah. stuff's it's that stuff's going to happen. Yeah. No, yeah. it really is. And, and I think that's so funny. Like a lot of people, you caught two nice fish off the bat. And to me, I think the mental side of things are just so fascinating where if you catch your kicker right off the bat, you got to be thinking like, Oh shit, all we got to do is fill this out and we're going to be cashing a check. Did you ever have that point after those two? And, there, and this is a two parter one stressing to fill out a limit. Two, we are going to at least cash a check today. I didn't think about cashing a check because it's, I mean, Smith Mountain Lake, I mean, you might you might need to. I mean, obviously, again, having that nice kicker, that that doesn't hurt. Uh, but, I mean, I think we continue to catch fish. So, it wasn't, I mean, you just keep fishing. I mean, I, I don't think, I, I don't know about you, Brian, but I didn't really think about but it. Our, our train of thought is if he and I are catching them like this, then probably half the clubs catching them like this, so you you don't get too excited. That's too negative, man. Come on. <laughs> now we did we did get. I'm pretty sure we had our limit fairly. It was probably I don't know when did we catch our fifth one. I know we left that. We did finally leave that area for a little bit, and I don't know if we picked up. We went into that code we talked about earlier, and we made a couple of laps around, but it, it didn't. It didn't seem to be producing. So we we fished the point and then made a lap around, and we came back. Uh, but then you had you had one. That, you need to tell that story too. The one you marked, and then and that was deep also. But uh, so we had three. That was, I, don't, I think it was on day two. What? Well, uh, you're right. So I don't know when for what for. You know, fish four and five. I, I can't recall. Um, it might have been towards the end of the day. Mm hmm. Because yep. we had our smallest fish, I think, was like just under two pounds. Mm hmm. So if we had had that small amount, that would have been, I think, we estimated a yeah. three pounds. 
and that would have put us right close to 20. Right. Wow. That's a solid bag. That's a really solid bag. And that's a lake that's hard if you don't know how to fish it, about that offshore schooling bite. And then, to me, that's what's so fascinating. There's some guys, they're great anglers. Don't don't get me wrong. They're river rats. And there's a reason like that's – right. you understand that as a logo for them because if it's dirty and two inches of water, you can't beat them. But if it's clear – and they're schooling, they're like, this is the moon. I don't know what to do. And the fact is that you grew up in an area that, in general, it promotes river rats. Mm -hmm. And yet, you guys buck the trend. You guys get to deep, clear water. You're like, yeah, I'm going to double down. This is where we're going to pay our mortgages on this lake. And that's that's insane. Yeah, yeah, I think it is always trying to, like, like now, I mean, the thing he's talking about, title and stuff, it's grass. Like, we're trying to learn, you know, different uh, different ways to fish and so that, you know, because it is always changing. And so that if something's not working, we, we feel comfortable enough. We can, we can try something different yes. um, and still catch fish because that's the way fishing is. And just like he said, from day to day, it's going to change. And if you don't have, you know, several different ways to catch fish, then, you know, and again, we're not consistent. So in saying that, like, but, but we're still working on our trade. We're still working to try to improve on maybe what we don't do well or how we can, you know, fish, whether it be the offshore or grass. Well, what, what's funny about that is we've been fishing together for like seven years now. And just this past Potomac tournament, he admitted, he's like, man, I hate fishing grass. <laughs> I never knew that. You know, I always thought he, he, cause I don't mind fishing pads and grass and, and he's like, man, I, I hate fishing grass. I hate fishing grass. And I was like, really? They didn't know that about you. <laughs> so, I mean, that is a mindset. If you go into, you know that you're on the Potomac and you have to fish grass. And but, but that's weird because grass is definitely something where it takes time to mm -hmm. learn. And, and it's so weird how there are some people that are just super comfortable with it and others that aren't. And it's a different mindset that hard and cover. It really right. is. Right, it is. And there are some people that like... And, I've had so many people, and again, this is where like having this show is so amazing, where you can like interview different types of people. And there are some that they look at hardcover and like mm -hmm. you move, you move to one place to another, whereas grass is like you sit. Mm -hmm. Grass is more of a sitting place and you got to be methodical yep. and you go through it knowing eventually you'll find pay dirt. Yep. And, and that is so fascinating to me where you have the, these two different dynamics, and but you have that on the boat. And I mean, continue talking about that. Yeah, I think, you know, and it is, it's, it's so, you know, and then let's go to day two. Like, you know, we go out and we have that success, but we come in day two knowing it could be totally different. Try, you know, almost fish the same pattern. It does not as producing as well. So we said, let's go around and we go back to our cove, but we, again, we don't like what we're seeing in. So we found kind of another point different though. It's not as deep, but it is a rocky kind of a rocky point. And we had, I don't think we caught him there last year, Brian. Um, we caught him closer to the dock, but not off where we were. And we found a school of fish between the docks. Yeah. Uh, last year, deep into the cove. They weren't, they hadn't moved up into the cove at this right. point. I think we realized that there's no need to go up into these coves. We need to stay out towards the main lake of these coves. Yeah. And that's what we did. And, and, it, and Brian started having success. I mean, he hooked a couple right off the back, a couple smallmouth. And uh, really got it started, you know, for us uh, day two on that point. And I think I think we picked maybe three up. I think I had one and you had two. Yeah. So it was a different style of fishing. So I guess my point is, you know, day one was kind of deep, uh, deeper, um, you know, deeper sus suspended bass. Day two, we went to more of a kind of a hard bottom, like you were saying, Thomas, point with smallmouth on it. Um, and so just, you know, mixing it up a little bit, doing something a little different. Um, and we caught fish again. It wasn't wasn't first place fish, but we were still able to get fourth at the end of the day. But you're playing with house money and this two guys and, and making sure that we didn't like just roll over it. They won that tournament, uh, which really put them up high angler of the year points going into the second day of the tournament, because even though they were down there for two days, it wasn't like a one tournament over two days. It was two separate tournaments. So mm -hmm. they win the day one tournament, um, put some in really good standings for, because they've only fished two tournaments at this point, Lake Anna and then Smith. They go into day, day two of the, the Smith Mountain Lake tournament. This will be the third tournament of the year. You're playing with house money. Now you're relaxed. 
which is why I think it also helped you going into day two because yeah, it's like, okay, you won, you, you did your thing. And I think that's gotta be good going into your mindset of you're fishing relaxed and clean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Going back to last year, after the first day this year, that was three tournaments in a row that we, you know, finished in the top five. And so we knew we were, you know, you, you have confidence. It's like having a conf confidence in a bait. We had confidence in what we were doing and, and we had confidence, you know, that we could, um, you know, figure out where we needed to go on that lake and, and just bide our time. And, and we were going to, you know, do well, we had that feeling years ago, at Lake Anna, but that's, you know, kind of, disappeared so i guess uh smith mountain lake is kind of like our new lake anna but what but what's interesting is the fact that with lake anna based on what you've told me you fished generally speaking on the bank whereas smith mountain lake without live scope you're fishing offshore you're fishing suspended fish mm -hmm. and so you're fishing it differently than you do lake anna right now you're beating the bank and everyone's doing that like it's highly pressured very few people, unless you're a local, are fishing that 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 secondary tier of fish, which are the ones that are not right on the shore. And that's so fascinating. Like, like, and you're doing that without live scope. And it's so funny because everyone bitches on this show about like the live scope thing. And here you guys are. You don't even know how to use the Lawrence you have. And you're out there smoking fish that are in the middle of nowhere. It's like people don't appreciate like you can do this stuff. And I do think some of it, I still believe in right place at right time. And so I can't, you know, you can't, yeah, I mean, you know, there's some people flip out like, what do you mean to have a plan? Like it's, well, you know, and, and you hear people, even the pros say this too, I'm just going to go fishing. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can have a plan and sometimes it works. I've heard Swindle say too, you know, I like, wish I could have told you I had a perfect plan and this, you know, it doesn't happen that way sometimes. And so sometimes you do have to kind of maybe luck into it. Um, but from that figured out. So after, so day two, two, going back to that along those same lines, it does kind of dry up. The bite dries up where we're at. I think we had three in the boat. We go back to our normal spot. And then Brian actually uses, and he's upgraded his electronics. Uh, he's now got two on the front, um, two different sizes. And you can talk to that, Brian. But we're able to look at down imaging and also the contour lines right up well, front. I've always, I've always had that. I just upgraded to what I had up front was a seven-inch mm -hmm. screen. And, you know, being 51 years old now, I got tired of leaning over so I, the only thing i did was i upgraded to two 12 inch 12 at the console 12 thank inch you front, and I, I kept my nine inch for for the chart so i have two up front but i don't you know it's still just the standard hds3 uh down imaging i've got the 3d um all that on there but um no i but, i agree i keep telling my wife the reason i need two 15 inch screens up front is because i can't see anymore and therefore that's why i need to spend 10 grand Sorry, it's, Carly. No house. No yeah. house. He's got to boat. He's got to upgrade. So forget the house. That's a 10 year plan. But yeah, that's the 10 year. We're getting the graphs. Happiness first. Happiness first. It makes it easier for me to see what's going on. Um, but no, but still, the fact that's so crazy that you smoked them and, and going into it, did, did you fish? And just to make sure we reiterate for the new people that are watching now, you fish new water, correct? Or did you fish basically the same place? New water from last year. And then, uh, and then, but after day one, we, again, just kind of recycled, recycled yeah. you know, the day one fish. And then, you know, Brian was able to, he, he picked up on it. Uh, he was on the front of the boat. He kind of marked some fish and then I think what floated back over him. And uh, yeah, I had marked the standing timber and then I uh, picked up the, the, um, uh, the understand and then spun the boat back around and then threw it where that standing timber was and, Picked up, I think the last fish, I think it was, a, we only had, did we weigh in five fish on day two? Yeah, I think you picked that fifth one up there late. Yeah, I think we had four fish, and there was like maybe 40 minutes left to go. And then I picked the fifth, fifth fish up, and it was right around two pounds. Um, so, and that's what we've, we've struggled this year, getting that fifth fish into the boat. And if you can get that fifth fish, even if it's a pound and a half, that's a pound and a half jump in the standings. And, it was nice to finally have two days where we got five fish in the, in the boat because we struggle with, you know, three fish, two fish. Brian, like, by chance, could you, do you have an underspin on you? Like, how do you set up your underspin? Uh, it's just a cool bait. 
Thunder Spinis as the brand name, and then I just put a uh, color I'd normally throw as Alewife, um, and it's just the four inch uh, Easy Shiner, and that's it. And a lot of times I'll throw it, let it hit the bottom. I might drag it. I might mm -hmm. they might hit it on the fall. It is really nothing. It's not rocket science. I mean, it's really pretty basic. Or I'll just slow uh, slow roll it right back to the boat. Underspins are so interesting because, like, I got big onto them when I went to college tournaments and I went to like Murray and places like that. And you had to throw them. And it's so weird when you bring that back here, no one throws an underspin. It's such a deadly technique for those suspended fish. Uh, and by the way, if you like to fish for striper, you can smoke some striper on those suckers too. Like, you can catch a lot of good striper on that. Yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, this isn't the, this isn't the same brand i don't think but i mean those that have never seen the underspin i mean yeah, it's it looks very similar to that except the the the, the actual oh, blade, really cool. uh the wire coming off the 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 uh, head isn't quite as long so the blade's a little bit closer to the belly right all right we're going to answer this carly bird if you buy any more tech for your boat that means i'm allowed to get another horse so that is a uh -oh. threat that is mutually Boy. assured destruction right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Um, you guys got fourth. You're you're in third. Go, I don't know. This is this is like we, we peak, guys. We're at the top of the story here. And now we're going to get into some turbulence. You're in third or fourth place in Angler of the Year. You're doing great. What's the next tournament? Two days at the Chick. All right. Let's rip the right. Band-Aid off. What happened? Bad, bad, bad. <laughs> Again, like, I think we've had what, Brian, we've had, I think, I don't know if we've had a first. I don't know, we've had a second. We've had a first. We've had a first and a second on the Chick. And again, over seven years. I mean, it's not like we're. Our first win ever was at the Chick, which was okay. kind of ironic because Tidal Water was what we had the least amount of experience in. And that hmm. was probably, I don't know, four years ago, maybe. Um, But it's, uh, the Chick to me isn't fishing. We've had tournaments in the spring. We've had them in the fall. Um, in the past, I don't know, three years, the fall has been so bad, they're not even putting that on the schedule this year. I mean, you're talking, there's been some tournaments where first place was six, seven pounds. And, and so we kind of, um, I don't know what's going on with the chick, but it just doesn't yeah. seem to be what it was five, six years ago. But to answer your question, I mean, Brian has one on day one. I don't catch a fish. We don't. We weigh one fish, and then day two we managed three fish. I think I had one. He had two. Um, I remember last year, you know, Ray and Randy again had a lot of success. They had four tournaments. They had big fish. They were sitting in second or third going in the last tournament. They go down there. It was the same thing. Ray catches one on one day, and they weigh one fish. And Randy catches one on the other day. They weigh one fish. And like, how do you explain that? Guys mm -hmm. obviously find them. If you look at the weights again, there's always guys that find them. They fish well right place, right time, whatever. But, you know, it, it was a struggle bus for us, for sure. And and it's a place, too, that we've managed, always been able to manage five fish. Even if we catch them late, we make a decision here or there, we go, you know, we catch them. Uh, but just, you know, for whatever reason, it just wasn't working for us. And, you know, tried some of the same consistent waters that we've always had success on, mm -hmm. um, but also tried some new new areas, too, and just to no avail. Yeah, the, the, uh, on that Saturday, the college uh, mm. series was the Bassmaster College series was down there, and and we saw I don't know, what, South Carolina, um, four Came or five, Texas. Miles, they were all just basically camped out in the pads, and so we knew that's what we had to do was we, you know camp out in the pads, but it just didn't just didn't work out. Why didn't you leave the check? You're going to James. Yeah. yeah, same sort of thing. We just I fished the James with the youth a little bit. Um, I know of some spots, but you know, it's just um I, I tell you too, and I, one of the main reasons too is you know, back to the success. You know, I was in that rut, you know, talking to Ricky Folk when we did that one podcast with Ricky Folk, you know, after Mississippi went down there, like he just things he was saying was really resonating with me. And that was right during the time I was in this funk and, he, you know, some things that he talked about that really resonated with me was about like, take that 22,000 acre lake. There's fish all over that lake. You don't have to, like you were saying, Thomas, you don't have to make those long runs 
to win. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah, you've had guys on there that say they, they it works for them, and that's great. I'm not saying it's wrong. So much is to take your time. Best use of your time is to really find an area and dissect that area and fish that area well. And so I think in, in slowing down. And so, you know, when you think about that, and again, it doesn't always pay off for us, but but we've also had a lot of tournaments where we make a short run, maybe 10 minutes, and we load up. And we, I can't tell you, a lot of those times we had success, we'd be sitting with two bo- fish in a boat by noon. And then all of a sudden, it was either him or I, or both, we just, we start catching them at one o'clock. You know, we do come back with a good bag. And so, and it's not because of a long run. It's just, it's, especially on title, you can attest to this, it's just waiting for that tide to hopefully turn yeah. and give you that good wind bite window. Yeah, and I think if, if, if we had spots that we had confidence in, to make a run, we would make that run. But when you're making a run to an area you've never fished before, I've always felt like tournament time's not the time to do that. I mean, unless you got zero fish and where you've been fishing, there's just absolutely nothing working. And it's kind of like, what do you have to lose? And we've made runs before um, where we would just go, we wouldn't, we wouldn't go that far. We just go find a new spot somewhere. And, um, fish that area and that has helped us um, we have stumbled on some some spots but they haven't been like a half an hour run because i've always said you go half an hour down half an hour back there's an hour of the eight hours that you don't have a line in the water so if you're going to make that run you better have confidence that there's going to be fish down there that's going to make that run worth it i had a guy on um he lives basically right on the right on chick. He works at a bait shop. His name's Hunter Smith. He hangs out with, with SB fishing and he talks about like how it's very cyclical, how the chick and the James are, because what will end up happening in his mind, he lives on there is like all the big tournaments come in and they take a lot of the fish out of the chick and pull them into the James. Then the James is on fire. Then everybody basically runs from the chick and then takes and pulls all the fish from the James back into the chick. And it basically repeats itself. And I feel like that's what's going on right now with, with the chick is it's in the cycle of you had the tackle warehouse invitational tour there. You had the bass opens there and all of them are based up river and you had so many anglers pulling fish out. And I think it's going to take some time for that basically to reset. Um, and that's where I think knowing the whole river is so vitally important that you mm-hmm. can't just know the chick in general Mm-hmm. to have um basically perennial success there but it's such an interesting like system down there it's very cool mm-hmm. then you had another tournament let's talk about most, that most recently on a potomac right yeah you basically have- went from lake lake tide tide yeah and, and this tide you know potomac and you know again because we don't make big runs you know, predominantly we've been out of Occoquan and Aquai, and the last couple of years has been straight Aquai when we go out of Potomac. And so, and again, we don't typically we run we've run down to Potomac Creek, but we've never been, uh, never gone into like Matta Woman and, and all these different areas that they you know you hear guys talk about. So, going out of Lee Savania is where we went out of. That was new water for us. You know, you hear about it. You can look on a map, um, and so. Again, we're going in blind. We hadn't pre-fished. Um, and so we make a decision to go to Matta Woman first. And the water was dirty now. And I'm saying this too, you know, second, you know, it's one of the top three places came out of Matta Woman. So it's mm-hmm. not to say that those fish weren't there. Same thing. They they were caught there. Uh, it just didn't work for us. And that's where the, all the catfish came from earlier. Yeah, on. it worked for catfish. Yeah. <laughs> so what was the change you made? Uh, we went up to uh, Belmont Bay. Mm. Uh, up, we had fished that the last time. We used to fish. Uh, we used to launch out of Occoquan. And last time we had the tournament at Occoquan, we actually fished and had some success around that small island. It Basically, it's at the end, almost at the end. Um, actually, it's just beyond the no wake, the end of the no wake zone. Um, and we had fished there, and we pulled up, and, of course, there's – it's like a parking lot. There's people everywhere, um, you know, fishing 50 foot apart. And so we said, well, there's gotta be something because not that many boats would be here. And, and, um, so we went in behind there and still, of course, we didn't really see guys around us catching any fish either. 
and um, I guess it was we floated on down to just below that island where everybody else was also parked. And I think that's when we caught our first bass. I think it was probably noon by the time we caught our first bass, which wow. is crazy listening to some of the other guys because they were, like, shocked, like, you know. But they didn't go up into where we went in the Matter Woman, so um, we just went to the wrong area in Matter Woman. Yeah. And that's how and it is. At that time. It, and that's so fascinating to me, fascinating how different parts of the river – turn on different times of the year so example is usually when the first bfl happens on the river a choir is on fire and usually mid-april early april matter woman is on fire and then it's like after that when you get into mid-may belmont is on fire and it's so interesting like how each section of the river has its moment and Look at the standings. The first ABA, the first tournaments of the year, a lot of them were one out of Matter Woman. And then you go back to like three weeks ago and everything was one out of Aquia. And then the BFL that just happened, I had Alex on, he won it out of Belmont Bay. And I just think that's so fascinating how you have this place. And it is, like you said, you could go to Matter Woman, but if it's the wrong time of year and that thing's not on fire, you're done. You're not catching anything. And that's, that's where practice, and you can't, again, I say, you can't beat these river rats that fish the Potomac Team Series for the last 30 years. It's so hard to be consistent against them because they have the pulse check on that river. They really do. And I think, you know, the thing, too, that, I, that I'm still learning, and again, that we walk away from, we're driving up the road, you know, we're having conversations about, you know, what we would do differently and things like that. And again, you have grass. Everybody knows there's grass there, but you still also have, docks you have wood you know, have submerged wood you have you know so it's you know i hear guys that you know the grass wasn't their thing so they they stick with what works for them and and they catch fish right and so good fish and so you know again it's that you know trying to find out we caught some fish on a hard bottom too brian found that it was kind of on a wind balloon thing and he, he started catching them and we we caught a lot of fish but it had a, it was a 15 inch slot. And so we had a lot, I think 14 and three quarter or 14 and they were some chubby fish, but you know, we had to throw them back. And so we wouldn't, we wouldn't have placed, but um, you know, we had, we had fish. Uh, it just wasn't the right fish. Brian Henry, that term was one out of quiet. Yeah. My, my, and, and Brian, if you're listening to the whole show, that kind of gets back to my whole point about like, you got to be on the right caliber of fish because the week before Alex won the BFL out of Belmont, and then this was run out of a quiet. And I think it comes down to like, you got on the right school of fish. When you're dealing with these massive grass mats, like you are, it literally is. You have to be in an area where they're, they're pulling up. We're because... going to turn the table here. I want to ask Brian Henry a question. Uh, oh boy. Brian Henry. I think he was on fire uh, on, on the Potomac. And I think he, if I'm not mistaken, Brian, did he not catch uh, what three, he had three, three pounders or something crazy had like his first two fish i think were like three and a half and like a three two oh, snap. Started day off so henry it's now that you're on here you got to spill the beans bud it's let's see in the comment here after, so. mr kvd oh i gotta love these I, again if you'd like to come on the show at some point brian again like i've told everyone the door is always open if anyone wants to come on here it's all doc talk until you put your words behind it and you actually That's come right. on the show um actually yeah we got tons of chats we have to get through right now let's get right up here jeremy surrett jared and brian what are your favorite baits to throw this time of year hmm. so who wants to go first uh probably shaky head right now um i mean i'll throw the underspin year round uh but you know Cinco, shaky head uh, I like to flick shake also. So I, I like working the bottom. Um, I used to crank a lot, but I've kind of gotten away from that. Um, I've lost a lot of confidence in the chatterbait. Like I used to chatterbait a lot, but um, when push comes to shove, you know, I, I like to fish the bottom. Yeah, I'm going to throw, I, I love a big TRD, you know, Z-Man big TRD, um, and a green pumpkin goby. Um you know, I'd, okay, right there. I'm gonna go with this. You know, on the bottom, just fished on a Ned Ned hook. 
Um, I'm gonna that's from the bottom. I love throwing a spinner bait, like Brian was saying. Uh, this is a CT custom spinner bait. Um, huge shout out. Yeah, with a um, this color blade. Um, drawing a blank right now. Copper blade. Uh, but like Brian said, I used to be big chatterbait guy. I still throw it, but the spinner bait's coming back to me. Yeah, I, I love dragging a jig this time of year as well. But uh, uh, spinner bait, like I say, a spinner bait for a moving bait. And that that's so interesting, like how that stuff goes basically into like these rotations. Where like I again, when I fish the Potomac, and everyone is just winding a chatterbait, and you're like, is the chatterbait good? because it literally does outfish everything else or is it because if literally everyone throws it of course people are going to say it's working because no one's throwing anything different and i like how you see the spinner baits coming back because i think the spinner bait is going to come back too because it's been off for like five yeah. to ten years it's, so it's been a long time camera the spinner bait's kind of taking a back seat i agree right. but yep. i think it's starting to reverse though yeah i'd agree no i i 100 percent agree with that um let's see the change out oh here's a good one Brandon Salise, um, what happened with the camera angles in your last episode? I think you're meaning the river, river keeper episode. Um, I had a camera die. And so that camera basically died on me right now. We only have one camera that's working. That's working consistently, which is the one that we have right now. I am saving up some money. So we'll get another one, but yeah, that's if it wasn't for Jenny at Jake's bait and tackle hail, I was able to get the security camera footage and I was able to like take time and tears to lip sync that to the audio to make it work. But besides that, we would have no episode. So again, I apologize for the bad video feed, but that's what happened. We basically got one camera right now. So Jenny, thank you so much. Um, let's see. <laughs> Brian Henry again, uh, 3.54, then 3.26. Stud. Stud. stud muffin. Absolute stud muffin. Um, Scott Fuller. Hey, Thomas. Great job on Monster Bass Podcast. Yes, I was. Yeah, if you guys don't know, um, I was invited on that show last week. That was a very unique opportunity. Thank you guys for having me on there. Um, yeah, I like the idea of a, a call-in show. I really do. It's a very unique opportunity to like have call-ins. And maybe we could do that at some point for here. Mm, that's cool. uh, let's see. Got a couple more, but no. So then what do you guys are thinking right now? Like with the rest of the season what's next so we go back to potomac on june 4th i think it is a sunday just get through the potomac <laughs> and get back to the place. i'm actually looking forward to it though from the standpoint that now we've been there done that like it's not and again not saying we're gonna do great but it's like now we're going in you know having seen seen that water because and like the question earlier like you can only look at a map so much Mm -hmm. and it's not until you get on the water and, and then the other thing is conditions too you know what what kind of yeah. conditions are, are the, is it giving you is it pre or post front you know is it bluebird skies is the wind blowing like just there's so many other factors that go into it that you know i know i could do better at as well just reading those factors but uh yeah potomac next one day yeah um, we learned a lot from that day too so yeah going forward mm -hmm. what is the next lake on the schedule uh, Gaston in September. Ooh, That'll be yeah. a two day. Yeah. And I'm you looking forward to that. I've had some, we've had been down there with the youth a uh, good bit. So I feel like, you know, as far as, and again, I'm not saying we're going to do well or not. Um, but at least I feel like we I have some spots to fish. Um, it, it won't be new water to us. Gaston is interesting, especially with the, um, the whole, spotted bass situation how clear it is and the weights mm -hmm. down there i got to go down there um with the the sb crew a couple weeks ago and they talked about how it's like taking like 12 to 15 pounds to win and sometimes 20. Mm -hmm. the only time it takes 20 is if you find largemouth if you mm -hmm. don't find largemouth the weights are extremely tight and so i don't know that, that'll be fun there in september too as well mm -hmm. um Let's get, so I'm saying let's get through these questions and then we can uh, kind of finish this thing off for the day. So let's see here. Jeremy Sutton again. When will Jared be back on the show? Um, I want Jer I want Jared back on the show. I have one camera right now. I'm saving up money. If you guys have told like a lot of this stuff has been remote lately. As soon as I buy.
buy another camera and I have it, we can do more shows in person again. Um, and we'll be back to the regular thing. And I'll so, speak to that too. And Jared's super busy. He's never, <laughs> never available, like between helping with the youth and then the 10 tournaments that we do. And like, it's in it. But I, again, hats off to Thomas. Thomas, you are knocking out content. Like, I mean, you're dropping two a week I'm now. On with these. I mean, it's, it's, I know it's a lot to edit and, and so, and for it to be successful, you got to do what you got to, you're doing. And that's just continue to put, and you're getting some great people on. I mean, and that's the, the back to that question. I know you get more questions to get to, but you know, the other thing to do is watching these podcasts. I mean, I've watched the podcasts, other podcasts and Brian, I know is he's religious on podcasts. He's listening to podcasts every day. And so the knowledge you get from that. And then the thing about Thomas is though, too, is it's local it's local stuff so you're going to hear from people that are fishing these bodies of water and i've had conversations with brian like hey man thomas just had this guy on that fishes you know the chick and it's from maybe the chick grew up on the chick and did well in smith mountain lake and it's just that that information and knowledge you know you just can't beat that i mean and thank you so much for that i mean i really appreciate it and and i to deflect because i don't like talking about myself you do volunteer a lot with high school youth organizations. And, and I really want you to talk about that because I don't think that's brought up enough. Like you are a captain, correct? And how do they need captains? Or is there enough captains? Or is that something that we should really get more people to volunteer for? Yeah. So right now, like our Frederick County Club, we're good. I think we we dropped off last year. I think we only had like eight, eight boats going. Um but you have a, a middle high school or middle elementary, middle school division, junior division, then a high school nine through 12. Um, and, the, and it does, you know, as a state, I think we're you're running 75 to 85, 90, you know, total in these tournaments, uh, the north and the south division, um, probably over 100 combined. And so um, it is a lot. We're trying to we're going to try to recruit more kids to get involved. We've been proud of our Frederick County bunch. You know, we sent four to the four teams of the state tournament last year out of the eight. Um, and of those four, and again, I couldn't be more proud of our guys. And, you know, I have two kids on my boat uh, and they, they snuck into the state tournament uh, on the chick. They qualified on the chick awesome. qualifiers. And then um, they got in and then they were sitting, we had three teams, three of the four in the top uh, 15 after day one. And then I'm sorry, three in the top 10. And then I think we ended up with uh, three total in the top 15 overall in the state. So I, I couldn't be more proud of our guys. We got two qualified for nationals going down to Lake Hartwell uh, end of July. And that's Cam and Thomas Newman. Uh, Brian Newman's our boat captain. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's watching these young kids. I'm telling you. And, and I'm telling you, too, I learned I've learned so much from just sitting and watching them fish. Because there's something to be said about when you got a rod in your hand, you're thinking differently when you're fishing compared mm. to sitting back, what like Brian was saying, watching the graph and just seeing what's working and what's not working and picking up on these fish are offshore. They're off that dock. They're not on the dock. And so anyway, but the youth are kind of our future. And I'm telling you, there's, you know, Virginia Bass Nation is a place that you can go. Um, and there's, there's program clubs all over the state. And so, if, yeah, if you want to get involved, uh, we have a way that you can get involved and just, you know, reach out to us uh, anywhere in the state. They're doing a lot of great things. Um, these these youth are they're, they're sharp. They're good. The, they're the future. And so if you really want to help and grow the sport, that's where you actually start. I mean, in good deal, what you're doing right now and, and donating so much of your time and resources is really commendable and keep up. The and it's work. Fun. I always tell them I think I have as much fun as they do. Yeah. And you even told me in a heart to heart, like, like you really like being a coach and you want to make sure that they do well. And, mm -hmm. and honestly, that's why you need to go fishing more, not work. Mm -hmm. Because if you fish more, you'd be a better coach. Just saying. Like um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, Brandon, again, life felt weird without a podcast episode today. Also, you need to do more live streams each week and four episodes per week. Give me. I can't. Um, <laughs> um Thank you for the kind words. I This is not my full-time job. I make enough to break even. Maybe if I'm blessed someday, I could just do this full-time. I'm not saying it's out of the possibility, but God, I could not do that and be married. So, But thank you so much for the kind words. Um, Chris Sherwood, a call-in show would be a blast. I would love to figure out how hard that would be because I think you need like a lag 
So in case somebody says something a little sporty, you can like bleep it out. Um, I need to figure out the logistics of that, but yeah, that would be super duper cool. Um, let Larry again, where would you like to fish? Okay. I'll bring that to you guys. If you guys could have your druthers, uh, Brian, you go first. Where would you like to fish? Perfect world. Uh, I'd say probably somewhere down South Hartwell, Norman. Um, yeah, somewhere down that, down in that area. I'd say probably Hartwell. Ooh, Hartwell. Okay. I, I like it. The underspin blue back hair and thing. Yeah. You're, you're staying true to yourself. Jared. Yeah. I don't know. Like I'm kind of, I, and it's not just because of success, but Smith mountain Lake to me has so much to offer. Um, like we all, we've only hit the, not even the tip of the iceberg. It's, there's just so much to that water, um, that I'd like to, cause I, and I do believe too, the state record smallmouth is in that water and is going to come out of that yes. water. I agree. And so I love a small, and what I love about Smith too, is you have that small mouth, uh, really good small mouth population and you got your good largies, you know, so you got, your, you got your crappy, you got your, um, striper. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of sport fish in that, that body of water and it, it, uh, you know, it's, it's a big lake, but it can fish small. And, uh, so I don't know. I just think that's, you know, I would like to retire down there. Um, you know, that's something that, uh, I would just like to fish more, I think. Closing thoughts, guys. I think we're all done with our chats right now. Uh, if, if you guys have another chat to get in, please get it in now. Cause we're going to, we're going to be rounding this thing up so we can all get on with our, with our busy lives. So yeah. Brian, I'll start with you. Uh, just uh, it was great being on. Uh, Jared told me this afternoon that it was live, and I was like, what, live? And uh, so I, I've actually never done this before, so this is a first time. Uh, but it's, it's you know, when you start talking fishing, it makes it easy to for conversation just to flow. But, oh, you're so very good at this. Appreciate you having me on. No, th I mean, hopefully, thank you. Hopefully we'll have other tournaments where we can, you know, be successful and, and uh, come back on. I, I'm expecting great things from you guys at Gaston in September. And I would say, too, like one thing that – what's that? I said Jared's been talking it up. He's just like oh, – Oh, that's going to be a kiss God. of death. We'll go out I've and blank. Once, so, <laughs> um, so it'll be pretty much a, a new body of water for me once we get down there. I just – I was thinking, too, you know, tournaments aside, it's one of those things that just uh, – you know, the times, not even tournament fishing, just the – the good time, fun times we've had, like you was talking about a break in period at, at Smith Mountain Lake. And Brian, you you never forget, like going into from the, going into Walmart, the Walmart trip to like this house we're staying in. There was this this big spider. I mean, this spider was huge and it was in the bathtub. And I'm like, oh my God, it was the biggest thing ever. So we kill it. We, well, I thought I would have killed it and we try to flush it and the thing wouldn't go down. And I'm like, just flush it. And then I don't know, we were like two little, you know, two little sissy girls like you know scared to death over this big spider but anyway the, this the stuff that happened has happened on our fishing trips whether it be on the river floating a river or you know on the big lakes um just the like he brian said earlier the camaraderie and the experience it's not the competition's great but really the the time on the water and the 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 fun that we've had fishing like he said earlier, you can't put a price tag on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we spent a lot of money on it and it's kind of a passion, but you know, it's, it's, they're good times. And so, you know, I just encourage people, it doesn't have to be competitive, you know, fishing. It's, you know, some of the best times. Yeah. Have been... We had a lot of stories that don't even involve being on the water. Right. You know, a brake caliper on the side of the road and, mm -hmm. and, and just, you know, he, Jared was talking about the break in period with my boat. We did the break in period. We can go fish, and this is like, and that is a great story that we're gonna have to finish on the next episode like when you guys one. come in there. Right. Um, and then we have Brian Henry saying, "Great job, guys!" We Henry, gotta get Brian Henry on, send him the invite. Yes, Brian, you're gonna be coming on here shortly too uh, to finish this thing out. Um, hopefully, when Brian's connection gets back, we can uh, have a proper yeah. oh, it looks like he's back. Um, guys. I, again, I can't thank you enough. I really appreciate you on. We got up to, uh, I think we had 30 people watching at one point, which is, which is fantastic for a channel of this size. Um, I mean, to give a retrospect, I was on the monster bass podcast. We had 50 people watching and he has 150,000 
subscribers, wow. 150,000, and we have 20. So we're like right there. The community is really tight that watch this thing. So I appreciate it. Again, guys, link in the episode description, everything we talked about. Jake's bait and tackle, of course. Thank you so much for everything you do in this community to help grow this fishing culture. Um, we might be talking here a little bit longer, but uh, we're done here. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.